What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt here with Mike K. Midweek playoff edition, no huddle show. How you doing, Mike? I'm here. <laughs> happy New Year, by the happy, way. Guys. Happy New Year, Zach. It's like we've never talked before this podcast today. It's it's a it's a new decade. It is a new decade. As I joked on Twitter, the Eagles have yet to suffer an injury this year. Or a loss. So or, a, they, or a win. They're undefeated right they now. They didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, I mean, they're pra- they've practiced today. <laughs> but, I, by the way, I should say, whoever came up with the schedule for the year, for the calendar, and decided that New Year's was coming on a Tuesday, not a fan. <laughs> I believe that God? was just how, how like, <laughs> Maybe God math works. Maybe like, like, him, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's BS is all I'm saying. We should start off right off the bat. Major breaking oh, news. Oh yeah, right, this is this is emergency podcast. Uh, yes, this is an, a huge emergency. First transaction of the decade. The biggest, the best, and the worst at the same time. The Eagles bring back former fifth round pick Sheldon Gibson. Did not expect to see that. This morning. Yeah, <laughs> um, they put Brandon Brooks on IR uh, as that was expected. Doug Peterson said Monday that uh, Brooks suffered a separated shoulder. And on top of that, he had even more damage, needed surgery. He was going to be done for the postseason. On Tuesday, the Eagles IR'd uh, Deshaun Hall, who suffered an ACL tear on the final play of the Week 17 Brutal. game against the Giants. Replaced him with an intriguing prospect in Elijah Holyfield, who is the son of Evander Holyfield, the famous boxer. Went to Georgia, had a really productive final year there. Um, He's the real deal, if you will. But he ran a four seven eight forty at the combine. Dropped. Uh, a lot of people thought he could be a late day two, early day three guy before the combine. Ran the four seven eight, which is both of, not both, good. Both of his ears are intact. By the yes. Way. Oh yes. That's important to note. I've made that joke four times today. I'm not even kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, if he's on this team next year, it won't be the last time that joke is. He made. is ro- ro- rocking number thirty three. Uh, oh. My favorite number. Um, that's a good number for a running back. It is. Josh Adams uh, was killing it. <laughs> Leading now. rusher for last year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, they've brought in Elijah Holyfield. They brought in Sheldon Gibson. Interesting perspective on both of those moves. So Elijah Holyfield, you bring him in because that way it's basically like signing a futures contract without having to wait yeah, till the end smart, of the postseason. Yeah. On top of that, he can serve as insurance. Remember, the Eagles have used basically two running backs the last four weeks. It's been Boston Scott and Miles Sanders. Now Jordan Howard is cleared for contact. He didn't really play against the Giants, but his shoulders should be good after getting seven weeks of rest. Um, if Miles Sanders, who has a low-grade, low ankle sprain, can't play against the Seahawks, Jordan Howard and Boston Scott would probably carry the load, and then Elijah Holyfield would probably be active as an emergency Backup. He's got to learn the offense in a hurry. He's getting three days of practice. Chances are he's not going to touch the rock all that much. Um, he is an intriguing player. The Eagles did like him during the draft process, visited with him at the University of Georgia. Again, this is a probably a more of a move for the future, locking down a guy who was on the Carolina Panthers practice squad all year. Instead of signing him to a futures contract, you're getting him on the roster. You don't have to worry about anything. Sheldon Gibson's a little different because... A, he knows the offense. B, he can be a core special teams player. C, there's not a lot of tape on him, so he can be an intriguing asset uh, for them in the playoffs if need be. And D, if they need to cut somebody to make room for Deshaun Jackson next week, Sheldon Gibson makes a lot of sense as a one-week rental. Um, Gibson's going to come in here. He's going to play behind the practice squad trinity that I call – that's what I call Rob Davis, Greg Ward, and uh, Deontay Burnett. And, you know, J.J. Arcega-Weiss has been dealing with a foot injury. He clearly was limited against the Giants uh, in Week 17. So Sheldon Gibson, if J.J. Arcega-Weiss can't go, can be that fourth guy in the wide receiver group. They also obviously have Josh Perkins and Richard Rodgers, a tight end, who can line up outside. Same with Dallas Goddard. We're monitoring Zach Ertz's injury. But, yeah, that's my diatribe on the new transactions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there, there All right. We can stop now. I think we're yeah. Good. I think we're done. This <laughs> podcast was a win. But I will. So I mean, it's not. It's obviously not good that Brandon Brooks got injured, and I mean, Deshaun Hall is not a big loss, but it stinks for him. But that does prevent present the Eagles with the opportunity to sign like a young guy like Holyfield for next year. Because now I think guys that are 
were on practice squads are basically free agents now, right? Yeah, yeah, they are, and they can get signed to future contracts. And there's no reason for a guy to like just stick with the team when he, if he's on the practice squad, like right. this time of the year. I yeah. mean, well, and you look specifically at Sheldon Gibson and Holyfield; they're both coming from franchises that had their coaches both be fired. So, oh, good point. You know, you don't know what. So this it won't be the same be. staff that knows who he is or anything. Right. Like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's less incentive to stick around. We should talk about Brandon Brooks's injury because I think this is going to be a vital yeah, yeah. part of what happens in this game coming up. Um, Matt Pryor substituted in for him, played very, very well against the Giants. Did you rewatch the game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he did he a really, out, really yeah. He um he's a he's not the same as Brooks, but he's he definitely anchors well. He's got some some strength. Uh, technique isn't as great as Brooks, obviously, but. You know, he's also it was his first player. real action of the of his well, career, he, basically. Actually, he played against Seattle too. Remember when uh, Brooks sorry, had to leave? Yeah. Okay. Well, so this, the, if he starts this week, it would be his yeah, first. Yeah, he's like, played less than ninety game. snaps. Yeah. Yes. Um, so here's the situation. So Lane Johnson. When we're talking about right guard, we also have to monitor right tackle because Lane Johnson is coming off a high ankle sprain. Uh, Big V is filled in for him for three weeks. Played pretty well. Um, he also cross-trained at right guard throughout the offseason, and he would typically be the first guy up uh, on the depth chart at right guard if need be. The problem is if Lane Johnson isn't going to play, you want V to play right tackle, and you probably want Pryor to play right guard. This would be Pryor's first start of his career, and it's in a big playoff game. Not sure you want that to happen. Ideally, I think the Eagles would like to have big V at right guard and Lane Johnson at right tackle, you just don't want to force Lane Johnson although, out there. Although Big V did, has struggled when he's played guard in games this year. Sure, sure. Um, Not, I still they would put him in over Pryor for sure, but I, I think that's important to note. He's been right tackle is his best position, pretty clearly. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a drop off. Yeah. Regardless, no matter who's in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But having Lane Johnson on that outside kind of lessens the blow, I think. You know. Um. You know. This Seattle Seahawks defense isn't a great; it doesn't have a great pass rush, but they do very. But they have a lot of guys that can blitz and do certain things. And you want to have experienced linemen in there so they understand protections. Um, if Miles Sanders isn't out there and Jordan Howard is maybe limited, you're also dealing with Boston Scott having to play a lot of protection. Uh, you know, protection blocking on third down. So you want to make sure your offensive line is equally set. Uh, Carson Wentz is going to have a lot of pressure in his face, but he needs to be able to handle that pressure. And I think the more starters you can have in the lineup, the better. Uh, v is obviously very experienced at right tackle. He's p- played at left tackle. And he's played in big playoff moments, too. So I think that helps as well. Um, big V is going to get paid this, this offseason. Yeah, so I actually wanted to talk about, like, I th- there's more than, than even, like, the playoffs and how Pryor looks this game in terms of like this season. I think what how Pryor plays this week is going to pl- play pretty heavily in that a little of their offseason plans, I think, because, like you said, Big V, he's gone after this year. I think you've, we've learned this. He's played better this year than he has, even during that Super Bowl run. He was a little inconsistent, honestly. Um, they're going to miss him. Like, he's been just like, especially with Jason Peters being banged up, when Jason Peters is likely off the team next year and Dillard's replacing him, you don't have that Dillard option at left tackle as a backup anymore. You don't have Big V as the option when Lane Johnson gets hurt or someone that right guard gets hurt. So if Matt Pryor can become that swing guy, I mean, you're gonna if he can really play well this week, then they might go in this offseason, okay, we don't need to spend a lot of money on a veteran. We don't need to use a high draft pick. If he doesn't and he struggles... I, I wonder if that becomes like a target for them or how they approach the offensive line. I, I mean, maybe, I don't know if they make Sam Malo back up or if he they're grooming him to replace Kelsey eventually, or because he he has played some tackle too, so maybe they 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 can stand to upgrade at left guard. He's not like amazing or anything. So I, I offensive line is going to be one of the more interesting subplots of the offseason, I think, and we're going to learn a lot if Pryor winds up starting, which he might not, because I feel like Lane is going to battle through his ankle thing even if he shouldn't because it sounds like it's pretty bad but like do do you agree with all that yeah i think i think isaac will be a starter in some form or fashion next year yeah yeah, he's getting low-end starter offensive line money so it is flexible if you wanted to do that they did just restructure some of his money to make it cheaper next year yeah right might be stuff to pay him but (laughs) that said i think if you're looking for a swing tackle it's interesting because Pryor's probably, if he does play, it'll be at right guard. I think his future's probably more at swing tackle. Yeah. Um, I think he'd be the long-term replacement for Vitae or at least the next two years. 
TCU guy also. Because you've been training Nate Herbig to be the backup center. You've been training Isaac Sa- uh, or Suo Peta to be a backup guard. I mean, they'll probably draft somebody or rely on Jordan Maylotta. With the 10 picks, I imagine they'll get a lineman or two. Right, yeah. yeah you know, that's their and that, belief. Unless too. they really, really believe in Jordan Maylotta still, who hasn't right. played a single snap this year. So. Oh, in two years. Yeah, um, yeah, good point, yeah. Yeah. Um, that said, uh, I do think the ideal lineup would probably be Jason Peters, um, Isaac week, Samalu, yeah. Jason Kelsey, Big V and then uh, Lane Johnson. When you know you have two suitable backups in Matt Pryor and uh, Andre Dillard, um, you know we talk about the running back position. Boston Scott showed a lot in Week 17. I don't know if he's necessarily ready to handle the load against a pretty decent defense. Um, the Seahawks tackle well. They've got good linebackers. Um, he's going to need some help from Jordan Howard or Miles Sanders if Miles Sanders can go. If they limit Miles Sanders' touches and you have Jordan Howard and you do kind of like a three-man weave, I think they're in, in an ideal situation. Boston Scott won Offensive Player of the Week this week, by the way. The first Eagles player to win a weekly award this year in yeah. Week 17. And Carson, Boston Scott, like we all predicted. <laughs> to quote Carson Wentz, how cool is that? Yeah. I thought that was, how I thought cool? was kind of neat. Like, I, I <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, and, and the thing with Boston Scott is now there actually is film on him like there really wasn't before. I mean, there was some, but not as like the guy. So I would imagine the Seahawks will be a little more prepared to try and stop him if he's the guy. I, I, I get the sense they, I don't, it's, they're kind of being vague about Miles Sanders. Mm-hmm. I th- he was out there for war, that just did a walk. Well, he day, stood but, on the sideline. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm I think not, he plays. I think he's going to be questionable in the final right, injury yeah. report. I imagine he plays. I'm not sure it'll be a full workload. We still don't know what to expect from Jordan Howard, so it's going to be a heavy dose of Boston Scott regardless. Well, and I think that's kind of appealing, too, is you yeah. don't know what to expect from Jordan Howard. Well I, well, I think the Eagles are are playing that we don't know card pretty heavily this week. Yeah, well, they're, you got they're, to. They're acting like Zach Gertz. I mean, Zach Gertz is the one that other teams have to prepare for the most. Mm-hmm. Um, they're playing it off like he's maybe going to play this week. I'm very skeptical about that. I am too. I don't know about you. But, yeah. but whether he plays or not, I think Dallas Goddard is a top 10 tight end in the NFL right now. So, um, yeah, yeah, talent-wise at least. Uh, so, again, just because he is that doesn't mean you're okay losing Zach Ertz. Which is, so, so I, I get, when the reports came out that Ertz was going to be like after the year, I tweeted something along the lines of like, if you don't have Zach Ertz in the lineup in the playoffs, I have a hard time believing this team is capable of going on a playoff run. I wasn't taking a shot at Dallas Goddard. I just think within the context of this offense, you don't have anybody at that point. Like, these guys have played well, but you, Zach Ertz helps that. Like, Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think we've doubted this team pretty yes, regularly, true. and they've pretty I, regularly yeah, proven us wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, it's they have the hardest way, way of going to battle with all their injuries. Like, uh-huh. out of and, all these teams in the playoffs. But, um... But yeah, but I mean, sometimes that makes teams better, yeah. and that gives them more chemistry, and they're catching heat at the right time. I mean, the and Eagles' offense stuff. has been at its best when everybody's been hurt <laughs> so well, far. So, and and I think some people have made this on Twitter. I think there's something exciting about Carson being able to be the most experienced voice in that playmaker. Yeah, around. yeah, yeah. For him, yeah, yeah. And I think he's done a very good job of being a leader without the clout of Alshon Jeffrey, Nelson Aguilar, Deshaun Jackson, kind of being in that huddle. I think the offensive line has kind of protected him very well. Um, he seems very sharp. Nothing seems to bother this team. It's like... Every year. Every year. I mean, if you want to take one thing away from Doug Peterson as a head coach, it's there's never any panic. It's always calm. It's, it, it almost sounds cliche at this point, but it, it just like becomes true every year. Well, and sometimes it seems disingenuous but it's legitimate like there is no I, I mean we even talked about it this year there's been, there was many moments where this locker room felt like it was on the verge of blowing up and it just like it gets like right to the edge of it and then they come back and then they're they're fine like well, they start winning the game it's about winning obviously but well and just thinking about it there's guys that they got rid of that i think if they didn't get rid of those guys could have been a problem yeah it could have zach brown orlando scander well clearly orlando scander oh my God. um you know uh, I think this team, and look, when Doug Peterson was hired, they talked about his um, emotional uh, intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah. He's got an emotional intelligence IQ of a bajillion. Like, yeah. I, I, it really is impressive the way he's handled this. Maybe he doesn't always handle us the right way, or maybe he doesn't always he win, the, locker room the, right when way, the yeah. press conference. But yeah, he uh, 
He's done well. Something you and I wanted to talk about um, that we talked about off the show is micro. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, everyone's quick to criticize when the offense isn't playing well. But I think Micro deserves a lot of credit for being able to kind of get some explosive plays out of this offense with very minimal talent. Um, you know, the wide receiver group, while it's been s- slow to kind of progress, there have been guys that have stepped up. And I think Gro takes some ownership in that. We talked about Greg Ward's three stints here. Mike Gro was a wide receivers coach or an offensive coordinator in each one of those yeah. those summers. Um you know, Rob Davis has been on the practice squad. Mike Groh has taken an extra interest in some of those practice squad wide receivers from what I've heard. Um, you know, I don't know if he can take a lot of credit from Dante Burnett, who had experience. and, and At least getting him ready in the plays and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, and I, th- I know J.J. Arcega-Whiteside's taken time, but after speaking to a lot of veteran wide receivers and former NFL wide receivers, it does seem like learning the wide receiver position can be a different learning curve for every guy. It You know, some guys are asked to do certain things, some guys or asked to do certain things in college and have to adjust. So I think, uh, I think Gro, I think Gro sticks around as of now, unless the offense like puts up like a turd against the Seahawks. And it's to the point where like, it's, that's, that's the interesting thing. Like it, all this positive talk could go away if they have all the same issues they've had for the season. In this well, game. yeah, not go away, but like, that talk will be reignited. I mean, Doug Peterson's been very quick to praise both yeah. he and Carson Walsh, who we'll get into a, probably a broader discussion later yeah. on in the off season yeah. and this week. When the season's over, yeah. Um, keep in mind, a lot of coach contracts end on January fourteenth, which could—I mean, the Eagles could still be a, around the playoffs and those get extended, but um, that'll be an interesting date. Uh, on top of that. Defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz is taking a lot of heat. I think in four of the last five games, he's called probably his best games of the year outside of Green Bay. So, yeah, if I were to, to rank his top five games, I, I would say Green Bay would be one. Buffalo well, would be even two. Even Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers had like 400 yards. Right, but they were able to I know they still won. Right. Yeah. Green Bay, Buffalo, uh, both Giants games, and then I'd say this, the Cowboys game. So that's five games right there that I think he's really been able to kind of put his stamp on. Um, we talked about the Deshaun Hall injury. Uh, that's going to free Jannard Avery up probably for more snaps. I doubt they're going to put Sharif Miller in a playoff game. No way. Um, but he, what's interesting is he, I, I did a story on Jannard Avery this morning, and I was curious because he there were two games during the four-game winning streak where he didn't play at all on defense. And so I asked Jim Schwartz about it in his press conference on Tuesday, and he brought up a coverage play that he had. And I'm wondering if they view him as a guy who can fake like he's going to blitz and be in coverage, because that's what he did against Saquon Barkley in the red zone uh, in the second quarter on third down. Uh, They sent Nigel Bradham and uh, Malcolm Jenkins up the middle on Daniel Jones, and homie Avery went basically stride for stride with Saquon Barkley. Uh, which made it difficult for Jones to jump the ball off. So I'm interested to see how Jim Schwartz kind of evolves this defense during uh, the postseason. Cornerback is interesting, too, because Jalen Mills is dealing with an ankle injury. Ronald Darby's on IR. Um, Sidney Jones is playing well. Russell Douglas didn't have a very good game against the Giants. Uh, Craven LeBlanc played one of the games of his life uh, in the slot. Navante Maddox is coming off an undisclosed injury. So I'm really intrigued about how they're going to group those guys together as well. Yeah, and Cravon's a guy um, who kind of reemerged because he he hadn't kind of flown to the radar. Right? He had he had barely been playing. He didn't even play against the Cowboys. Right. Um, he played all most of the snaps the other day. Jim Schwartz like said he was one of the reasons they won. They love him. He, the, he loves to like give him credit. Yeah. He's the one last, guy. Last year he said he like they he saved their season or whatever. Yeah, right. Was, yeah. Or he's, he's the, the key to their season. Yeah. He's the but, one guy. I mean, he, the guy deserves to be on the field. That's just the, like he's pretty consistent. Yeah, I would in start his him performance. In, I would start him in Nick. Um, and Vivante played decently on the outside if they yeah, want to do that agree. again. Um, so it'd be interesting what they do with that. One, one more thing I want to talk about before we get going, maybe read some comments. I, I was debating with some people on Twitter. Uh, Dan Orlovsky went on first take, I believe, and was debating with Max Kellerman, who isn't even worth mentioning some of the things he says. But Dan Orlovsky's like, defense of Carson Wentz was that he thinks he's been the second he's had the second most impressive season of any quarterback in the NFL 
I, I understand that impressive is different than best, but I still don't agree. That's just like, if you're talking about the full season, that's ignoring all the bad games that Wentz had, and he had a bunch of them. Yeah. Like, he hasn't, he's been really good. I'd say, if you, if we're factoring in all the weapons and all that stuff, which I think is over-exaggerated a little bit when you're analyzing him, because he does have Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard, Miles Sanders, mm-hmm. Jordan Howard, whatever. Great offensive line. Um... Maybe it's top five most impressive. Maybe it's top ten. It's not number two. He's not the. He hasn't had the second best season to Lamar Jackson this season. Or yeah. second most impressive. So I, I mean, know, I think I Ryan, know the wording is different, but Ryan Tannehill has the third best passer rating in NFL history. I mean, Russell like, Wilson, I think, has been more impressive than Carson Wentz. Yeah, year. I agree. Um, I would say, I think that's just hyperbolic. Is all it I was is, to but say. also the criticism of Carson is hyperbolic yeah, yeah. too. And but, I think well, that that's, that's the Max Kellerman rea- reaction to it. Well, I think that's the reaction. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's it's. It's there's no like middle ground, yeah. and I think look a lot of people are bringing up this stat that he's the first quarterback to pass for yeah, four thousand yards it's without a five hundred yard wide receiver, but like that's kind of misleading because he has it's ignoring two, yeah he has a nine hundred yard tight end and a five hundred a six hundred yard tight end a five hundred yard uh, running back. I mean, most of history tight ends weren't like wide receivers like that right. right now, it's yeah. a completely different game even than it was five years ago. Yeah. Tight end has become a. I mean, Zach Ertz is a wide receiver. Like right, he lines up at wide receiver probably thirty to forty percent of the time. Yeah. Um, I've seen people make the argument about separation and that Carson's throwing in a lot of tight windows. Well, cool. He's not the only person doing that. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have made the comments about not having uh, a Pro Bowl or an All Star wide receiver. Well, he hasn't had a Pro Bowl wide receiver. At all in yeah. his entire career. Also hasn't made it when he was right. Yeah. So uh, he hasn't had a thousand yard wide receiver outside of uh, Zach Ertz being a tight end last year since he's been here. So I get it. Getting past the four thousand yard mark is extremely impressive. What he's done this season is impressive. Do I think it's the number it, two? Yeah. Number no. But I mean, he's been balling. He's been straight out dealing the last four games. Yeah. They, he has willed them to win. So you can talk about the low scoring or whatever. In the fourth quarter, this man has been unstoppable. And in the red zone, he's been unstoppable. So I think Carson deserves an, a boatload of credit. But I think to, to ignore the context of what Ryan Tannehill has done with a Titans team that's not super talented and oh, coming oh, his off... His numbers are like historic. I mean, he was left for dead. He, he was left yeah. for dead. I mean, and, I mean, even like Drew Brees is 40 years... I know he's Michael Thomas, but he's 40 years old and he's playing as well as he has his entire career. Right, and Michael Thomas has 33 more got 33 more catches than any other wide receiver in the league. That's yeah. nuts. And the, and the Saints have, they have Camara, but they have no other pass catching options in that offense that are good. Well, that are not, they're no, they're no one. They're better than the Eagles receiver. Right, yes, yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> look, he's the, put, the point being, yeah. he's put up with a lot of adversity. There's no question about that. And he's played very well. He's also had some really rough moments and it's okay to take both of those and say, it's a good season. It's a good. He was actually very good at the beginning of the season. Yeah, it was the middle part. It's yeah. the middle. You know, it's the the That's jelly and the peanut butter that is just not working. Seahawks, Patriots, Cowboys, those right. Games. And you know what? I think if he goes out there and he rips open the offense on Seattle, look, we'll be talking about this being one of the better comeback stories uh, in recent memory. I think Carson has proven that he is a franchise quarterback. I think he's proven. That 2017 wasn't a fluke. I think he's proven that he's the right guy for the quarterback job over Nick Foles. <laughs> Clearly, it was almost like they switched situations because Nick Foles was injured for basically most of the year That's and then point, yeah. and struggled after coming back from injury. But um, you know, I, I think Carson Wentz has proven the Eagles right in that contract extension. He clearly has something to build on. He is. We've talked about. I've said before that I didn't know if Carson could could elevate the play of his uh, weapons regularly. He has done that the last month. And that's why the Eagles are NFC East champions. And that's why they're in the playoffs. And that's why you and I both think they've got a shot against the Seahawks. Yeah. Uh, as of now, I think they're going to win. I um, do too. Um, all right, we'll do some comments and we'll get going because we got to get to the locker room soon. Uh, Layers80 says, Wentz getting it done with a bunch of Novacare parking lot attendants. Trust me, the parking lot attendants are not that quick. <laughs> um, some people calling us clowns. Uh, not some people, one guy. Well, I mean that's true. We are clowns. We do true. do we do do kids parties. So if you right. Dawson Garrett, you put a lot of thought in this. So I'll read it. My question: I think the Eagles get a couple of the starters back, and I could see them somehow finding a way 
at at least to the NFC Championship, if not the Super Bowl. I believe they can beat the Seahawks. I feel like the 49ers are not experienced in the playoffs. The Eagles are to beat the Packers at home. Do you think there's a more than 30% chance that the Eagles, that if the Eagles beat the Seahawks, they can make the Super Bowl if they get their players back? I would say it's probably at 30% yeah. chance. Yeah, like, that would be the max. Yeah, I mean, I do. I agree with you. I shot, think yeah. San Francisco's lack of, uh, you know, they've played some tough games and important games, but they've also almost given up some important games. Like, they've had a lot of games that are really tight scoring. Um I do think the Eagles are so battle-tested that you do kind of give them a fighting shot. I think as long as they avoid New Orleans, they've got a decent shot of making a run. That's their uh, kryptonite. Uh, Mr. Ridley, this team just thrives under pressure in tough circumstances. I said after the first Giants game, Carson will go Vinches 2017. He's hungrier than anyone in the league now. The backups all stepping up is incredible. Edward Chamberlain says, deeper we go, guys will start coming back. Uh, well, one guy will. Keith Coffin says the season of the Giants is coming soon. And then there's a but when? there's a spam account here that I'll show you the name. Oh no, I know I, I've, I've seen it. Yeah, uh, and that's interesting. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> our audience is weird. <laughs> you know, like highlights a part of the video for some reason. All right, anyway, uh, Sean Brooks. So my question: How does Seattle game plan for a team that is unpredictable due to having no idea who the hell will be playing? There's a not a whole lot of film on these guys. <laughs> it's a good point. It's a good point. They probably have to just assume guys are playing, honestly. Yeah. I, like you, I mean, you prepare for Zach Ertz. you got to you know? crack open that Deontay Burnett uh, they probably have Jets stuff, team. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. One there. All right. Um, again, sign up for Eagles Extra. We're still pumping away some text messages, and we've been sending some exclusive stuff. It's on NJ.com slash Eagles. It's free for two weeks. Do it. Do it. Uh, leave us some reviews, write us some comments, and uh, we'll talk to you guys for a preview pod later in the week. Deuce!